He made history as the first Indigenous member of the House of Representatives in September 2013, and he became the first member re-elected for a second term. Can you please join me now welcoming to the stage the Honourable Ken Wyatt. Sherry, thank you very much. When you get old, you've got to change your glasses. In West Australian Yungar language, I say kaya wanju, hello and welcome. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I want to thank Uncle Raymond Davison for his kind welcome to country and his warm welcome to land that is important to him. Thank you also to Professor Kerry Arabina. I've always admired the work that you've done. But I'd like to acknowledge Brad Hazard, uh, the Minister for Health and Medical Research, Elizabeth Koff. It's great to be back here with you. Uh, being here is like being home again with so many of the familiar faces that I uh, spent five years growing up with and spending time with. Stan Grant, Indigenous Affairs Editor for the ABC. I want to acknowledge uh, Christine Cousins, MP, if she's here. Mr Steve Blunden, I want to acknowledge you in particular because you were a great friend and a great mentor. To Scott Monaghan, the work that you have done is tremendous. I just want to single out Geraldine Wilson, who once worked for me, was part of a team that really focused on what I'm going to talk about. Today's theme of Aboriginal health, it's time to reset, is critical to the future. But I, be, but I believe much of the required reset involves learning from the knowledge of the past. That's why I want to talk about health and heroes and their fundamental importance from the day we were born. A few weeks ago, I experienced one of the highlights of my year when I met a 14-year-old Sydney boy called Jacob, who had just won a prize for writing an incredibly powerful story, and I'd like to share some of it with you. He said, let me tell you about Ricky, my hero at school. The reason Ricky is my hero is because he is proud to be Aboriginal and I look up to him for advice about my culture. He is in year 12. His country is Kamilaroi. I'm a year nine and my country is Darug. Ricky is a great leader. Last year he taught the year eight boys at my school the Aboriginal war cry. He was really proud and excited to teach us and was offended when some of the boys were mucking around mocking him. He taught them how to be respectful of Aboriginal people and how important our culture is, not just to us, but also to them. They didn't mock it anymore. Ricky taught me that the war cry is important because it is about big cultural dance. It's a huge thing for Aboriginal people to show off their pride and culture because people have told us not to be proud for so long. It was amazing to watch non-Indigenous people learn it because it shows we are proud to be Aboriginals and they are proud to share it with us. Ricky wants to train me to do the acknowledgement of country and hopefully this year I'll get a chance. Ricky is an all-round awesome person. He is a laid-back, cool guy who loves being Aboriginal. He is respectful towards all people, including his elders and his culture. And I hope that one day I can be just like him. I'm sure Jacob will grow up to be like his hero, Ricky. He's certainly on the right track because when you understand where you come from, you can determine with confidence where you're going. If we think about where we are and where we came from, as First Nations people, we didn't need all of the organisations or structures we have today and we didn't need to put money into agencies. For 65,000 years, it was family-centred, child-centred and community-centred. Centred around a woman with her key roles as the mother and protector of each family member, and equally around a man, the father and protector, with his firm responsibilities. Yet now we live in a period in which we have come, which we have some prevalence rates of ill health that are unacceptable by any standard. It's time for home-based heroes, for fathers and mothers everywhere, to become family warriors as they were before, it's, and still are in functional families. We're not going to fully transform the health status of those who are struggling until every Aboriginal man and woman understands and is proud of themselves and their culture that perpetuated life for so long. Culture must be at the forefront of those early years of learning and acquisition of knowledge, just as young Jacob told us in his story. 
our mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts and grandparents, our families are the first protectors of our children, the warriors for their welfare and their future. As Anne Hollands, director of the Australian Institute of Family Studies says, the relationships within a family system provide the scaffolding for development and well-being. We know just how important family strength and responsibility is from the moment a child is conceived. Canadian research shows that from then until the age of six, it is a critical period for brain development and subsequent learning skills, behaviour and lifelong health. The first three years in particular can shape the brain's thought processes for the rest of your life. This is fundamental to the first 1,000 days, uh, days Australia movement and I thank Professor Arabina and her team for their tireless work for children and families. The first 1,000 days movement has men as shields, engaged warriors standing ready and responsible. As children, love, certainty and protection nourish our bodies, brains and cultural souls. Parents are our, first, our children's first and most important heroes. It's now time to highlight the heroes within our families and communities to move to empowerment from disempowerment, to move away from a deficit model. Across the Tasman, Murray Alan Duff made history in the 1990s with the book and movie Once Were Warriors. The story's portrayal of a family breakdown shocked the world. But he has much to say about Murray Heroes too, writing an entire book on the national and local favourites. He says every tribe throughout history has its own heroes. They represent us, the ordinary people, the people who have yet to realise their own potential. Every street and every town has its own heroes, the girl who models herself on the best woman she knows, starting usually with her mother, maybe her grandmother, a favourite auntie, <coughs> and adopts those qualities of, for herself of dignity and pride and ambition and most of all love for not just her own blood, for all around her, their heroines and heroes. Again, I hear resounding echoes of young Jacob's story. Contemporary Australian life should be complementary to the cultural focus that we have held on to for so long. But we need to harness modern health care and systems. Must be responsive. What successful programs are doing is challenging the paradigm of, of advice from sections of Australian society that are not reflective of or relevant to families and communities at the grassroots level. And I want to acknowledge the partnership that exists in New South Wales because between the Health Department and the AH and MRC, you have developed a focus on communities and families. And that is the strength of the partnership in shaping the future directions that New South Wales Health takes in addressing the health needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Today I'm announcing that an expert panel will investigate and identify barriers faced by First Nations people needing kidney donations to help ensure equity of access to life-saving and life-changing transplants. We know our people have seven times the rate of end-stage renal disease compared with other Australians, but are much less likely to receive a donor kidney. In December 2016, there were almost 2,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people registered for kidney transplants and dialysis, but in around 13% received transplants compared with 50% of other Australians. First Nations people are nine times more likely to rely on dialysis to keep them alive. Our government is providing funding of 250000 for the Transplantation Society of Australia and New Zealand to lead a comprehensive review into the hurdles, service gaps and practical challenges that are faced by First Nations people. This aims to increase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander transplant rates, reduce the burden of regular dialysis and give more First Nations people the chance to live fulfilling lives on country and in their communities. The panel will comprise of people with expertise in working in community, clinical settings, research and public policy, and will consult widely across First Nations communities and the health and transplantation sector. The panel's work will help inform the development of a long-term strategy for transplantation being undertaken by the Commonwealth, which is, it is hoped to be ready for consideration by COAG in 2019. Ensuring transplant equality is fundamental to fairness in, and closing the gap in health. Aboriginal and Torres Strait people on average are living longer than ever before. In fact, is contributing to the health equality gap such as death from heart attack and strokes are going down. At the very least, it must be properly targeted with investments based on family and community involvement, along with robust evidence that shows what works. I know that mothers and fathers armed with confidence in their culture are the frontline warriors and protectors we need. They are the custodians of commitment and hope. 
It's time for us to focus even more on reinvigorating our family custodians, giving them back their responsibility and their predetermined power that, uh, that evolved from the past. So that every mother, father, uncle, aunt and elder every day contributes to better health and cultural well-being. But we must work together to help reset tomorrow. So I intend to invite people from across the nation and across our First Nations people for a roundtable on how we can strengthen the families of the world's oldest continuous culture in transitioning the health outcomes for all of us within our communities. Families have been our constant for 65,000 years and today, more than ever, they are the custodians of our future. But equally, we must walk instead with each other to reset the agendas, reset the focus, but have the outcomes that achieve the longevity of our children in order to perpetuate a culture that is the oldest living culture in this world. Thank you.